I am going to turn in our Bibles to James chapter number 17 and uh, beginning with the, the uh, James chapter 5 verse 17 and I am reading just the first portion of this scripture. This is what I have been using for, well this is going to be the ninth week now. Uh, I planned on doing a week or two, three maybe, of talking about Elijah. It's turned into nine weeks now, uh, but so be it. Uh, and I want to read to you this first part where it says in chapter 5, verse 17 of James, Elijah with a, was a man with a nature like ours. Can you say amen? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And so I am... I'm going to preach to you today part nine of Elijah and you, and I have subtitled this, Getting Your Life Back Into Perspective. It's very important that we get our lives back in perspective, and there will always be a time in your life when you have to get things back into perspective, because life is cyclical, and we go through periods of time where we need to get our heads straightened out and get our lives back into perspective. Let's pray together. Jesus, we ask by your spirit that you will touch and bless in this place this morning. I'm asking for your anointing to be on my lips, that we might hear what the spirit of the Lord would speak to the church today. Open up our hearts and our ears. Bless us, Lord God, as we leave this place this afternoon. Use us, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Would you give Jesus one more hand clap of praise together in the house this morning? Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. I am not going to put the, all of these scriptures up on the screen behind me simply because i got a large portion I am going to read from. If you have a Bible and would like to follow along, I am in Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm picking up here with verse number 9. I just want to go over some things with us today as we talk about the story of Elijah. The Bible says, and there he went into a cave, the he there is Elijah, of course, and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, Where, what are you doing here, Elijah? <clears throat> what are you doing here? We need to allow the Lord to ask us, what are we doing where we are? in our lives, in our hearts, and in our mindset. What are you doing there? Where are you and what are you doing there? All right? So he said, this is what Elijah's response was, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left they seek to take my life. We talked about this last week when we talked about depression and how depression makes us feel that we are all alone. And sometimes we feel like we are all alone. Sometimes we wonder where Jesus is. Huh? Sometimes we wonder, where is God in all of this? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever wondered, where is God in all of this? He said, I alone and left, and they seek to take my life also. Then he said... God speaking, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks and pieces before the Lord. Now, sometimes that's what we want God to do for us. We want some great move. We want some great demonstration. We want to dance and shout in the service. We want to feel the presence of God. We want to walk on a high, and we want to know that God is in our midst. But the Bible says that the Lord was not in the strong wind. The Lord passed by a great and a strong wind torn into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces, but the Lord was not in that. Now, I'm not saying the Lord isn't in the shout. And I'm not saying the Lord isn't in the great, powerful worship. I'm saying there is something even deeper that we must connect with. And so the Bible goes on to say, the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. Sometimes we want the earth to shake beneath our feet, don't we? We want God to shake things up and put things back in order, but the Bible says the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire either. And after the fire, a still small voice. Let me tell you today that the thing that will carry you through your difficult times is the still small voice you hear in your prayer time. You can come to church every week and we can have a tear down service and the musicians could get us shouting and rejoicing. And when this COVID thing is over and these masks are gone, we'll be dancing in the aisles again. But I'm here to tell you something. That's not going to carry you through the week. That's not going to carry you through your life. What is going to carry you through your life is the still small voice you hear in prayer. That's what you need. After the earthquake, the fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Now listen carefully. I know I don't have the scriptures up behind me, but if you're reading along, notice what it says here. It says, he stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? No, I did not misread the scripture. That's right. Up there in verse 9, while he was in the cave, God said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Step up. I want to talk to you. I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the fire. I'm not in the wind. But I want to talk to you. I'm not, I want to talk to you with a still small voice. And so he got up out of the cave and he went to the mouth of the cave and stepped outside. And the Lord spoke to him again and asked him the same question What are you doing here? And I want to ask every one of you today What are you doing in the place where you are at right now? What are you doing there? I don't know where you are. I'm not trying to imply anything. I'm asking you to allow the Lord to step up to your cave and ask you, what are you doing here? What are you doing? Are you going through the motions? Are you just going day by day? Are you just going to try to make it to church next week? Are you going to finish the church service and go home and live the same way you lived last week? What are you doing here? Not here in the church building. What are you doing in this relationship of yours with God? What are you doing here? You see, I believe that we have got to come out of our cave of mediocrity, or God will not be able to use us. We cannot keep going through the same old, same old. Something's got to stir us up, and somebody's got to ask us, what are you doing in the place you're at right now? Are you doing anything with the gift I've given you? Isaiah, Isaiah, what's his name? Who am I preaching about? Elijah. <laughs> I, got a, I got a scripture from Isaiah down below. I'll get to Isaiah in a minute. He said to Elijah, or Elijah said to God, let me tell you something. <laughs> He didn't say it quite like that, but you can see from what he said that that's what he was thinking. I have been very zealous for the Lord. I stood up against all those Baal-worshipping prophets. That's what I'm doing. I called down fire from, from, from heaven. And then when the sacrifice was devoured, I called upon the people of God to destroy the prophets of Baal, and they did it. Guess where it got me? Now they seek for my life. If you think living for God is going to make everybody love you, you are living for the wrong God. I don't know if you've looked around lately, but we live in a corrupt generation. They do not love the things of God, and they're not going to love you if you live it. Mm, just saying. I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts. I've gone to church every Sunday. I have been paying my tithe religiously even when I couldn't afford it. I put faith above finances and put my tithe and offering plate. 
I've been on my knees every day. I've been seeking the Lord. I fast twice a week. That's what I've been doing. I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken you, torn down your altar, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm the only one left. My friend, listen to me. You are not the only one left. We are not the only ones left. We're not only not the only ones left in this world, we're not the only ones left in the capital region. I'm here to tell you there are people in the womb waiting to be born, and it's going to take you and I getting out of our cave to bring birth, bring them forth to their birth. Did you hear me? I said it's going to take you and I getting out of the cave of mediocrity to bring those babies to birth in the kingdom of God. The devil's job is to make you feel like you're all alone. You come to church alone. You go home alone. You live your life during the week alone. You say hi to people at church, but you're really still alone. It is the devil's job to make you feel like you are all alone. And God told, I, 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 he, whatever his name is, Elijah. <laughs> I had a rough night's sleep last night, folks. I don't know why. Woke up in the middle of the night, been up, been up ever since. So my brain's a little tired right now. I'm preaching anyway. I just do the best I can. Deal with the weakness of my flesh, all right? If I say any other name than Elijah, no, I meant to say Elijah. <laughs> all right? Unless I really mean it, then I'll tell you I really didn't mean to say Elijah there. Now I don't even know what I was talking about. It is the devil's job to make you feel like you are all alone in this. To have each one of us working independently of the other one. For all of us to feel like we're trying to do something, but we're trying to do it on our own. And I'm here to tell you it's about time we started working with each other instead of against each other. It's the devil's job to get us to focus on our feelings, on our wants, on our desires, how I feel about this. Why didn't they ask me to do that? How come I can't do that? How come I wasn't asked to do this? How come they get to do that? It is the devil's job to get us to focus on I when it God wants to do is realize there are 7,000 others that have not bowed the knee. You are not alone. So the Lord said to him, this is verse 15 now, go, <clears throat> return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Wait, you want me to go back into that wilderness? Yes, I do. Back to the wilderness. When you arrive, I got work for you to do. Now, last week we talked about the depression, and one of the main things you need to do to get out of your depression is to start doing something. Start doing something. Elijah was stuck in a cave of depression, and God called him out. First he said, what are you doing here? And then he said, good, get to the mouth. I need you to get out of this, this cave of mediocrity. I need you to get out of this cave of depression. And then he got out of the cave of depression. He said, now let me ask you again, what are you doing here? And then he said, you need to understand something. You are not alone. There are 7,000 others that have not bowed the knee. And I've got work for you to do. You can't get the work done in your cave of self-pity. You can't get the work done that God's got for us to do in your cave of loneliness, in your cave of mediocrity. It is time we stop doing the same old, same old for God and realize God has got a job for us to do to change the world around us. The Lord said to him, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, this is what you got to do. I've got a job for you. Number one, you're going to anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Number two, you're going to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And number three, you're going to uh, anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, and you're going to anoint him the prophet instead of you. <laughs> 
you're going to annoy somebody else to take your place. Now, how many of us would struggle with that? Huh? How many of us would struggle with that? Think about that for a minute. Now, a lot of us don't have too much to do, and that's, that's a shame. There's more to do than, than the few people that are doing. We all need to get busy doing something. But what if the Lord walked up and said, I got someone else I want you to go get them because they're going to take your place. I'm not sure we'd be willing to do that. I'm not sure we'd be happy about that. I want you to go get Elijah. You're going to anoint him as prophet in, in your place. Listen, the thing that God did to Elijah here was to help him understand something that every one of us needs to understand, and that is the power of go. Did you hear me? The power of of go, go anoint Haziel, go and anoint Jehu, go and anoint Elisha. You got to go. You cannot stay in the cave. You cannot live isolated. You cannot stop and just think going through the same old, same old is enough. We need to understand the power of the word go. Now, we get hung up on the power of the word come. And it's a good word. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Boy, don't we know that verse. Because it relates to us. If you're laboring heavy laden, come unto me. Cast your cares upon me. We're on it. We, all, we, we fully understand the word come. But do you understand that the reason God says come is so that he can now say go? Come unto me so that I can fix you up so that you can now go. We need to understand the power of the word go. You cannot sit comfortably in your cave of mediocrity any longer. You've got to go. You cannot be complacent in the routines of life. And life is a routine, my friend. Sometimes it feels like it's a rut. You wake up on Monday morning, you go to work, you come home and you cook dinner, you eat dinner and you're exhausted, and you go to bed, and you start it all over again Tuesday morning, and the same routine after routine, and Sunday morning comes, and you go through the routine, you get up, you go to church, you come home from church, and you got a routine, and it just becomes a routine, you don't even know what you're doing anymore. It's because we've become complacent in our routines. Somebody listening to me? We become complacent in our routines of life. You must not ever forget that you have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And it is that light that this world needs us to bring to them. And so to come out of the world is one thing, but we come out of the world so that we can go back into the world and carry something that we did not have before. And so you cannot forget that although you've been asked to come out from among them, you have been told to go to change somebody else's life. Elijah was sent from a cave to change Haziel's life from mediocrity to being the king of Syria. Elijah was sent from a cave to change Jehu's life from being the son of Nimshi to being the king of Israel. Elijah was sent from a cave to make a farmer, arguably one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament in Elisha. And you can't forget that you have the call of God in your life. But listen to me for a moment. The call of God is not to come. The call of God is to go. The call of God is to go. The Bible tells us Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19. And it's not going, there it goes. Matthew 28 verse 19, Jesus said go. Now listen, prior to saying go, he said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Didn't he? 
But after he gave you the rest, he said, go. Go, therefore. Now, you always got to know what the therefore is there for. Right? My old pastor brother, S.R. Hamby, always used to say, whenever you see the word therefore, you got to know what it's there for. Therefore, he said. What's the therefore, therefore? The therefore means, since I called you out of darkness and into my marvelous light, since I have set you free and delivered you from all of the sin that has bogged down your life, since I have put my mind back in you and made you right, since I have fixed you up and delivered you from all the things that this world has pulled you down to, since I set you back on your feet and put you on the straight and narrow, therefore, go and tell somebody else. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love that. I love teaching Bible studies. I got some people here that, in this congregation that I'm teaching a Bible study to, so you're going to get a little heads up of what's coming, so you can look up the answer and make the other people that don't hear this impressed with your biblical knowledge. Because it always comes around to being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I always love to look at anybody I'm teaching a Bible study to and ask them, okay, there's what we need to do. We need to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So what is the name of the Father? And I bet some looks at me like, I don't know how closely you can see me, but they look like this. That was me looking cross-eyed. <laughs> What is the name of the Father? They'll say, Jehovah. I said, no, that's just, that just means Lord God. That's just a title. Uh, Elohim. No, that's just another title. What's the name? I mean, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm, that's not my name. What's, what's the name of the Father? I don't know. What's the name of the Son? Jesus. Everybody knows the name of the Son, don't we? The name of the Son is Jesus. Okay, good. How do you know that? Well, because the angel came from heaven and said, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Okay, what's the name of the Holy Ghost? Uh, Holy Spirit? Nah, Spirit's just another word for ghost. What's the name of the Holy Ghost? I don't know. Let me tell you how simple it is. Jesus, who we know his name, said, I have come in my Father's name. So then what's the name of the Father? Jesus. And he said, and the Father will send the Comforter in my name. So what's the name of the Comforter, the Holy Ghost? What's the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? How should you be baptized? In the name of Jesus. And this isn't a lesson on baptism by any stretch of the imagination, but if you have not been baptized exclusively in Jesus' name, come and see me. Because I'll just do what the Apostle Paul did. He rebaptized people. And I'll rebaptize you. That's all right. It's okay to be rebaptized. Can you say amen? amen? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but he didn't end with that. He said, Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Aren't you glad he's with us always? Aren't you glad no matter where we go, he's there? How many of us truly believe that? How many of us really want to remember that sometimes? <laughs> it is so easy with so much going on in our world today to get lost in the troubles that exist in our day and just want to hide in a cave until it's all over. Huh? Just want to wait for it all to blow by. COVID-19 shows up. How many of you are looking forward to the day when this is gone? When it's not a threat anymore. Some people aren't doing anything until it's over. They're afraid to go out of the house. They're afraid to talk to people. They're afraid to do anything. They're waiting for it to end. We're living at a time of civil unrest, racial unrest, like we have never seen possibly in some of our lifetime. 
People are afraid to offend the violent. Afraid to let your voice be heard because of the violence that's on our streets, and we don't want to be the recipient of that violence. And so we're fearful. We got the presidential elections coming up. Half of us are afraid what's going to happen if the Democrat gets voted in, the other half's afraid what's going to happen if the Republican wins. <laughs> Can you say amen? We're waiting for it to be over, and we hope our country survives, whatever happens. I'm telling you, our country will not survive unless the church rises up and gets out of its cave. Emotions are running high. People are losing it at a moment's notice. And it's so tempting with all that's going on out here in our streets to hide in our cave and hope it all passes by one day and things get back to normal. And we can just come and have church and have a good time and go home, dance in the spirit and shout and worship and shake hands and hug each other and go back home and live our lives like we once did. And right now it's just easier to say nothing and hope we can stay under the radar. Because there's so much evil and hatred towards godliness in our world today, like I've never seen before in my lifetime. We are truly living in a day when they call evil good and good evil. Sometimes it makes us afraid to stand up for what we stand up for. And to say what we truly believe in. Come on, church, is it? Sometimes it's easier to just get back in the cave. Except there's a voice out there saying, come on out here, I want to show you something. Come on out here, I want to talk to you in the wind. It's so tempting to hide in our cave until it all passes. It's easier sometimes just to say nothing and stay under the radar. Not ruffle feathers, not cause people to get upset. We certainly don't want to be the one to call sin, sin. Because then we're called judgmental. Our religious freedoms are being challenged. Our Christian values are under attack. The spirit of the day that we live in calls evil good and good evil. The Bible is mocked. Christianity is frowned upon. Righteous living is considered judgmental. Isaiah, I told you I had something from Isaiah. Isaiah said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them! And yet that's exactly where we are in history, is it not? The church is called evil, judgmental, unmerciful. The sinners are called enlightened, loving, accepting. I read something the other day on Facebook. I don't do a lot on Facebook, I, more so now than ever, because we're putting our, our uh, my Wednesday night sessions are on Facebook, and so I'm more involved with Facebook now than I've ever been. But I saw something on Facebook I don't know, a few days back, and, and it just grieved me in my heart because it was somebody that said this. They said, just because a person is pro-choice does not mean that they support abortion. And I, I thought... Wait a second. I don't get that. And then they went on to explain. They said, just because I, I personally may not believe in abortion, I believe it is your right for a woman to do what she wants with her body. I won't stand in the way. I said, oh, I get it. I get it. I'm not actually going to murder anybody, but I'm not going to judge you if you do. Isn't that about what she's saying? I would never do it, but I'm not going to preach against you doing it. My friend, the church has got to rise up and stand against sin. I'm not just talking about abortion. I'm talking about sin all over the place, unrighteous lives, unrighteous thoughts, unrighteous lifestyles. The church has got to be the church. We have got to be a light in a dark world. we got to come out of our cave and let people know about Jesus.
Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Know this also, the last days perilous times shall come. My friend, they're here. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Have I just described 2020? Or should I say, did the Apostle Paul just describe 2020? He said these days would come. And he also said, from such, turn away. You'll never win them by being like them. You win them by showing them a better way. Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, because our wa weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. You're not going to see me out breaking windows of stores and robbing and stealing and destroying property. You're not going to see me do that to make my point. Can you say amen? You're not going to see the church of Jesus Christ out destroying the lives of others unless it's to bring you to a place of repentance and let you destroy your own life of sin and lay it down at the cross. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, they are not carnal, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. You know how we are able to destroy arguments? You want to know how? I'm going to wrap this up in just a minute. Bear with me. I'm preaching longer than I have in a while. Just bear with me for a minute. You know how we are able to destroy arguments? Because we learn by experience, because Jesus destroyed ours. Huh? See, when I first came into this, I had the argument that this kind of worship is craziness. Jesus destroyed that argument. I had the argument that this kind of lifestyle is too far fetched. Jesus destroyed that argument. And since he destroyed the arguments in me, I am able now to turn around and destroy the arguments of the world. We have divine power, he said, to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. And it is all in the power of the word go. Go. It's no longer time to sit in our cave and do our thing. It is time to go. It is time to come out from among them and be a separate people. It is time to let somebody know there's a better way. It is time to let somebody know that people of every race, every culture can sit down with one another and have the same Heavenly Father and worship together as brothers and sisters. It's time to let people know that Jesus is the mediator. And he's the common denominator. And so one more time, I close by saying this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. It's time for the church to stop surviving and to start thriving. So I asked Maranatha Ministries today, what are you doing here? God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? I'm asking Maranatha Ministries, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Well, we have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of this world have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They killed your prophet with the sword, and we're the only ones left. No, you're not. Not only are you not the only ones left in the world, you are not the only ones left in Schenectady. Wait, there's others like us? Yes, there are, waiting to be born. They are all over the place waiting to be born. 
I just preached a little bit against abortion. Why? Because that child in your womb is a living baby, a living child, needs to be brought forth. I'm here to tell you that's a city of Schenectady. It's filled with babies waiting to be born and waiting for this mother to bring them forth. But we got to go. What are you doing, church? We've torn down altars. They've killed your prophets. We're the only ones left. No, you're not. There's a whole bunch of them out there. So go and make disciples. Why don't you pray? Jesus, show me. Show me somebody waiting to be born so that I can bring them with me to the house of God. Show me where I can go to do more than just sit in my cave of mediocrity. Show me how I can rise up. My friend, I close by saying this. Jesus is still the only answer for our world today. He is the only answer for our world today. There is not another philosophy out there that will hold up in the long run. Jesus is the only answer. So let's get our lives back into proper perspective. And what is that perspective? It's all about Jesus.